Welcome to York History Group, everybody. My name is Kevin Freeman. Today is Friday, November 11th, 2022. I'd like to thank all of our members for making this group so informative and dynamic. Today is also Veterans Day, so we are dedicating today's presentation with gratitude to our many veterans past and present. If you are a veteran and tuning in, thank you. Thank you for your service. Today's presentation is about those who stayed home during World War II and did all they could do to ensure success for those on the battlefields and elsewhere. To introduce our guest, I would like to say it has been a pleasure for me to meet Tom Prince. Tom has researched York and Kittery's history for the past 50 years and contributed articles to the York History Group's Facebook page for the last three years. He has written many family histories and we couldn't be more pleased to have Tom as a member of the York History Group community. Tom has contributed a companion article to his presentation, and you can find that article on yorkmainhistory.org. So go over to our website when you can, if you haven't read the article yet, and check it out. Tom spent his childhood in Kittery and his teenage and adult life in York. Please stay at the end of the presentation and we feel and feel welcome to participate in our question and answer period. We will be joined by Kevin McKinney and Elaine Wood as well. Also, feel free to write comments and let us know where you are from. Or if you're, I would like to welcome Tom. Hi, Tom. Hey, Kevin, thanks. Um, as Kevin mentioned my name is Tom Prince. Um, some of you probably know who I am, but a lot of people probably have at least seen my name on the York History Group uh, Facebook page. I, as Kevin mentioned, I've posted several different articles and tidbits out there over the last three years. Today, because it's Veterans Day, I worked with the York History Group to come up with a little bit of a different twist on on um, uh, on the subject. The subject is World War II, and the subject is um, civilian activity and volunteer services during in World War II here in York, Maine. Uh, we're the, so the timeline for this is, you know, 1940 to 1945. Uh, I, I did a lot of research. Um, there isn't a lot of research actually out there. Are a lot of papers written about life in York during this time. Uh, I, I hunted for a lot, but I just couldn't find it. I did find some uh, photographs from old York Historical Society, and you'll see those in the presentation that I have. Most of my research came from the Portsmouth Herald and newspaper clippings. And I felt that those were very, very appropriate because they, they did tell what was happening, but there was also a lot of names that were listed. And I felt that to make it relevant for the town of York, we really needed to know uh, a lot of the names and the names of the people who did participate in all of these different activities. So that's my little introduction. Let me, at the beginning of my paper, I take a few pages to kind of just lay the, the um, the framework of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, and so I want to start at the beginning of the war. And the beginning of the war for here in the United States, everyone knows, was when Japan invaded or bombed Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. But it wasn't really the beginning of the war in Europe. And or the war uh, or World War II officially, that began a couple of years earlier. And I want to talk about some of the events in 1939, 1940, 41 that led up to uh, the United States getting into the war, because it's really going to help to understand the mindset. One of the things I wanted to do was to try to understand the concerns of people, the mindset, any fears that they had what motivated people to do the patriotic duties that they did. Uh, the war in Europe, um, it, it was really, it started in 1939, 1938. I know that Hitler and Germany in, uh, annexed Czechoslovakia. 
And we get to 1939 in August of 39 and Hitler and Germany had their eyes set on to invading Poland and France and Great Britain really didn't want that to happen. So there were, there were a lot of negotiations back in August of 1939 to, to stop Hitler from invading Poland. Uh, none of them were. Neville Chamberlain did not succeed in convincing uh, Hitler to not invade. So on September 1, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. And France and Great Britain kind of drew the line in the sand at that point and said, uh, unless you retreat from Poland, we're going to declare war on you. Well, Hitler didn't listen to them. Uh, and then on September 3rd, 11 o'clock in the morning on September 3rd, <clears throat> 1939, mm -hmm. uh, both France and Great Britain declared war on Germany. And that was the official beginning of World War II. It was in all the newspapers. And I mentioned the Portsmouth Herald. That was the main communication vehicle for most of the people here in York and in, in the surrounding area. The Portsmouth Herald back then was very robust. It had sections in it for international activity, like what was happening in Europe and eventually what was happening in Japan. And there was um, domestic um, updates of legislation in Washington and what was happening across the United States. They had reports on the regional side. Certainly the regional piece was the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and what was happening uh, in and around this area. And the Portsmouth Herald also had reporters for each town assigned. They usually were people that lived right in the town and they did a really good job in reporting a complete picture of what was happening. So the people in York knew when I say, you know, that Hitler invaded Poland, that was the headlines. I mean, they knew what was happening. And so people were able to follow it uh, quite closely. We get into 1940 and there was more activity here locally. The army was very concerned about um, the mouth of the Piscataqua River and being able to safeguard the Navy Yard. They mobilized a, a division of the army called the 22nd Army Coast Artillery. Uh, so the people in the area did see the army coming in. The, the Army Coast Artillery was in charge of the forts and the um, facilities guarding harbors. And just as it says, it was the coast artillery. Any of the artillery that was at coastline, the army was in charge of all of that. They took a look at the uh, at what was at Fort Foster, Fort Constitution, Fort Stark, and and all the equipment was outdated, and it was it needed to be upgraded. The concern the military had, the army had at that point in time, was really to have they they didn't know what. Nazi Germany was going to do, but they, there was a major concern that there could be warships that would be sent over and actually attack the United States. So they put in plan, put in place plans to upgrade the, the guns at these uh, coastal forts at the uh, mouth of the river. Uh, and so there was a lot of construction started to go on too. And um, they, the army, the Corps of Engineers put out plans to build 13 towers along the coastline. I'm going to talk about those a little bit later, but those towers were all tied into a new fort called Fort Dearborn, where they had these major guns that were going to be installed to be able to locate surface um, ships and, and to give them, um, well, they, that's that construction was was planned and was going to be started. They also had plans to uh, mine the harbor, uh, Portsmouth Harbor, and uh, and people knew about that. Over across the ocean, in May of 1940, the Hitler went into Luxembourg, went into Belgium, and did a military annexation of those countries. 
There was something called the Battle of France at the end of May, 1940. It only lasted two days because France essentially laid down their guns. And so now we have a military takeover from Germany into France. Hitler at that point in time, I mean, his real target was Great Britain. And he was intent to kind of break the morale and break the back of, of Great Britain. So in the summer of 1940, uh, they did a thing called the Battle of Britain, which was an air battle. Uh, it was all done in the skies. But, but Germany dropped a lot of bombs on, on Great Britain at that point in time. They were mostly strategic in nature, like military targets or airports and so forth. They stayed away from dropping bombs on London and citizens. But the Royal Air Force, the RAF, um, Britain's Air Force, was really victorious in this Battle of Britain. And they did a great job thwarting uh, the Germans, air, the German Air Force. Hitler then decided that he needed to do a little bit more. And he sat at a phase called the Blitz. And I, it's an important phase because a lot of people saw what happened. It lasted for nine months. It went from September 1940 until May of 1941. And the Blitz was just indiscriminate bombing of Great Britain. And cities like London took a beating, Coventry, Plymouth, England, Portsmouth, England. The difference there, that it was nighttime bombing. It was, and again, it was indiscriminate. There were 43,000 civilians that were killed in the Blitz in this period of time. So it was evident that Germany would bomb anything and anyone, and it didn't really matter whether he killed civilians, because he certainly wasn't targeting just um, military um, facilities at that point in time. The in the fall of 1940, our U.S. government started its or initiated the first wartime draft. Anybody, any man between 21 and 35 uh, was asked to sign up and have a physical and, and they were inducted into, into uh, the armed services in the United States. So here's a mobilization of, 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 of people into the armed services, a lot going on in Europe and the Blitz. And uh, there was also signs of, of a lot happening. I mean, the, the Navy Yard was starting to increase its employment. There were, there were notifications that there were gonna be a lot more submarines that were gonna be built there. So again, the people in this area certainly knew that there was something underway. They, they thought that maybe there's, you know, war is getting closer and closer to York, Maine. In 1941, uh, there was a, um, an act that was passed. It was called the Lend-Lease Act. It was, the United States did not get into the war from an armed conflict standpoint until after Japan took, took out um, Pearl Harbor. But the United States says, said to Great Britain, we'll help you with shipping you uh, military equipment, shipping you oil, and, and loaning you certain things um, to help, help your cause. One of the things that happened here locally in the Lend-Lease was that three British submarines were actually brought to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, and they were uh, overhauled. It took about six months to overhaul these three submarines. Uh, the, there was a call went out to try to get volunteers to uh, put up some of the sailors that were on these submarines. My grandparents who lived in Kittery took in a guy named Bill Fisher from Cardiff, Wales and put them up for six months in the house. And other people in this area also uh, took in British sailors at that point in time. So again, kind of getting closer and closer to, to um, uh, the uh, reality of a war. May of 1941 was a, was a key period 
this is when the when our government formed an organization called the Office of Civilian Defense. It was designed to I protect I, the citizens in the event of any sort of a an attack by by Britain. The attacks were that were conceived were thought to be by air, mostly by air or by the sea. Uh, but the Office of Civilian Defense was formed, and this was soon became a nationwide organization. Here locally, uh, it was. It, it, um, it was run out of Portsmouth. I'll mention that in a little bit, but they had, they suggested that towns build committees uh, of civilians because the civilians were going to be the one, not the army, not, you know, they, it, the, any of the military folks were thought were they going to be shipped overseas, but, but locally and in the towns, it was, the thought was, the civilians need to be able to mobilize and be able to form committees and essentially help to protect their towns and protect their citizens. And if there's injured, help do the injured, all of that. So there was a number of, um, uh, a lot of organization happened in that summer of 1941. I'm on the first slide. Do you, um, are you gonna, are you gonna put the slides up? now kevin yes yes okay uh i have 51 images that are going to be on the screen i'm not going to talk about all of them today you can read you can read my report to see it this one here is um from october 1941 it says york to mobilize an armistice day these committees that were formed were formed to again by for citizens, volunteers that were going to help to protect the town of York and defend it against the primary goal here was to defend against an air raid or air attack. The the um, the officials wanted to do a drill. And this is when it said mobilizing on Armistice Day. The drill was that was an air attack by Germany on York. And, uh, and these committees that were formed, there was a committee called the Home Guard, which are the overall, over, you know, the overall commanders of the, of the civilian force here, law and order, disaster relief, rescue and labor, medical, transportation, food supply. These were all subcommittees that were formed. What's great about this article here is kind of talks about the, mo uh, the formation of these committees. But what was made me smile when I found this article was it has all the names, the people from York that were part of these committees and subcommittees. And so there's a, it's a who's who's list of York citizens on, um, in, in this, um, in this particular article. By the way, Armistice Day, I think we all know, Armistice Day was originally November 18th, 1918. It marked the end of, of um, World War I. Uh, for some of the youngsters, they probably haven't even, don't even know what Armistice Day is, but it was, it's now called Veterans Day. I did look up when they, changed over from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. And it was 1954. So it was after World War II uh, is when the name of the, of the day and remembrance of, of uh, signing of the Armistice or the treaty that ended World War I. But they wanted to make it more relevant. What's the next, let's see. Go, let's go to the next slide. These are some of the names of people that were medical aid, food supply, that were, were from York and formed um, the committees. Let's go to the next one. Uh, another, another description, transportation, raising funds. And then let's go to the next one. 
this is this is an article that was appeared the day after November 11th. This is in the newspaper on November 12th of 1941. By the way, that, that, that was 81 years ago today that they did this exercise in York. And uh, this one lists off the, the home guard. Uh, a lot of people that were in this picture were, a lot of them had actually served in World War I. They're not eligible for the draft here in World War II. They usually were gentlemen here that were age 40 to 60. But they were the commanders. They were the ones that kind of ran the ran the show, and coordinated all of the all of the effort. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this this is again the description of what happened on that day, on that November eleventh day. The scenario was is that Germany came over. The, there was a there was a post an observation post down off of Roaring Rock Road where the observers noted that yes, the German planes were on their way and they notified the home guard and the home guard uh, not sounded the call for an air raid in York. Again, it was all an exercise, but, and uh, by the way, the, the sounding of the alarm was 10 short blasts of the of the whistle on top of the fire station at York Village and also in York Beach. That was the sound that people heard. There is an air raid and it mobilized these various committees to get into place and to be ready. They had been training for this during the summer of 1941. Let's go to the next slide. Again, description of what what happened on that day. By the way, there is a name, you, you'll see the name a lot, Dr. David Harriman. He was the commander of the, and the organizer, chief organizer of the Civilian Defense Committee here in York. Uh, the next slide, let's see. Again, more information, more names about um, people. It says here, members manning the post. Um, and lots of different committees, even down to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. Next slide. One of the exercises that they did is that the scenario was is the York Realty Building was bombed and it was on fire. Now the York Realty Building is across the street from the fire state, the present day fire station in the village right next to where Cumberland Farms is. It's still there, the building is still there. But they held an exercise where four different firemen jumped out of, out of the second floor window into a net that was outstretched by the other uh, firemen and they were rescuing. So the scenario is you had a building, burning building, we need to rescue the people. So four brave firemen jumped out of the second floor window. I was, I was interested when I saw this and looked at the names of the people who jumped out of the window. And one of them is Charles Ballantyne. And I think most people know that Chris Ballantyne is the chief of the fire department here in York Village. Well, this is his grandfather and kind of shows that it didn't really matter whether it was before the war or after the war, that the Ballantyne family certainly was one that volunteered and gave a lot back to the town of York because because Charles Valentine is listed here. I know Chris's dad was on the fire department. Chris is chief and his son Paul is coming up through the ranks and is also so there's four generations of that served um, served the town of York. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture that I got from the old York Historical Society. It's an actual photograph of what was happening that day. Uh, the, there is kind of a looks a, a, a body there that that's a fireman jumping out of the second floor into the net down below that was outstretched. It, it generated some public attention here. Everyone was very curious of what was going on. Uh, again, this building is you see in the background there, First National Store. There's also a central main power building. 
this is where that's where Cumberland Farms is right now. But so they're jumping out of the window. Let's go to the next one. I found this, I found this article and it was quite interesting to me. By the way, the, the drill that was held, bombing drill that was held by York was noted as the first bombing raid drill in, in the United States. And I think it was, because uh, I can't find any, any indication that other towns did similar. York was ahead of the curve at the beginning of the war here, and the volunteers came out of the woodwork. I mean, they really were anxious to help. And the, so it, it really, well, I, I, won't, I, I was gonna say something else, but I'm not going to. Um, so, Japan did, you know, they bombed Pearl Harbor in December, just a little over, a little less than a month after um, the bombing drill. So York was very well prepared. People were on edge. And this article was in the paper, just like a week after uh, the Pearl Harbor attack. By the way, after the Pearl Harbor attack, of course, the United States declared war on Japan, and then Germany declared war on the United States, and then the United States declared war on, on Germany. And so by December 11th of 1941, everyone had declared war on everybody, I think. And it was truly a worldwide conflict at that point in time. This article showed up and it was a woman, that, a York Beach person who was noticing suspicious activity at Short Sands. And she reported it to, to the authorities. I guess if you see something, say something was maybe, we even say that today. But uh, so there was someone down by Short Sands doing something and uh, she called in the police. Two police from York came and, and they called in an intelligence individual from the Navy Yard to see who to investigate this potential spy. Well, after they investigated, they found out it was just a person taking pictures, just like thousands of other people do of Short Sands. It's a nice, pretty area. So they, uh, uh, it was a false alarm. But the second paragraph kind of hit me a little bit. It, you know, you say, well, why would she have done that? Well, it says here, she hadn't been reading too many detective yarns, but she had been drilling herself to eat, sleep, think, talk, and live in terms of civilian and national defense. We talk about a mindset. This was the mindset of a lot of people. Everyone, there has been so much happening over the last two years over in Europe and uh, that that you couldn't, well, people were just sleeping and thinking and living in the, in the context of civilian and national defense. So you can't really blame someone for doing it, but it shows the mindset. Let's go to the next slide. Civilian defense. Um, I wanted to Let me just get my notes here. Um, the Civilian Defense Organization, I, I just wanna talk about that a little bit. Uh, I mentioned that York was part of what they called the Portsmouth Defense Area. To the towns that surrounded um, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard were all part of this defense area. And the Civilian Defense was actually run by the army, again, staffed all by civilians within the town, but they had, a, they had a command post over in Portsmouth, which was very active. It was called the Portsmouth Council of Defense. They were the ones at the Portsmouth Council of Defense that gave orders or instructions to the town of York. And the town of York, if there was activity, would give instructions or give the information back to the 
Portsmouth Council of Defense, and they would track all of the information coming in. So they had a really good idea of what was happening uh, all through this area. The towns that were made up the main side of the river were like Elliott, Kittery, York, Agunquit, and Wells. Those were the primary towns that made up the contingent of towns here north, north of the Piscataqua River. The civilian defense had two general categories. One was called a defense corps. One was called a service corps. The defense corps was, as I said, they were defending. It was, the design was if there was a, any sort of a, a air attack, the defense corps and the volunteers that were served on the various committees there would be the ones that would be able to handle that. So the people that were watch the skies, plane watching was all part of uh, this defense corps and other things called like dim out and blackout exercises. I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. The service corps was more of the volunteer side of, of support for housing and food and medical and interfacing with the Red Cross. But they solicited volunteers in both, uh, both of those areas. I was looking at the membership qualification for either the Defense or the Service Corps, and it was all able-bodied, responsible persons in the community, men, women, housewives, laborers, business and professional people, boys and girls and the elderly. What they were saying here is that everybody has a part to play. In, in civilian defense. Everyone can volunteer, we'll find a job for you. And these insignias that are on the screen right now really were all of the different categories of, of uh, civilian defense subcommittees that were formed that you could volunteer on. Like, and there's like air raid wardens and auxiliary police, fire, auxiliary fire, rescue, medical, nurses, aides, utility repair, chaplains, messengers. People would wear armbands to identify what group they were belong to. And this is, these were the insignias that, that people, uh, once they were trained, could be able to wear and help out their particular group. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there was a lot of pub there was a lot of messaging that was done during um, during this time and answering questions of people of how can I help and what can I do and they published like these booklets that were educational in uh, you know the first five booklets there it says it was conserve materials to win the war how to grow a victory garden we'll talk about victory gardens in a little bit how to get a job in defense work, what you can do in civilian defense, a book on first aid. Or what was interesting to me on this was really the messaging piece of victory depends on you. This was a message that was driven home to everyone, not just here in York, but it was really national. And you know, it mentions about we're either all going to win this war together or we're all going to lose this war together. And it's really up to you to get in there and to do your part to help the United States and to help the troops that are overseas. Uh, and that messaging was certainly something that was consistent and was throughout the war to be able to say, we're all in this together. Everyone needs to help. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about this, the, the aircraft warning service. This was one of the groups that was formed to, some, some people would call it the plane spotters, but this group was formed to watch the skies because the first thing you got to do is to prevent a air attack is to see if there's any airplanes coming in your direction and then be able to be trained to be able to uh, notify the right 
people and to have the civilian groups uh, called to action. Portsmouth needed to be called in and uh, let them know what was happening. The air observation service obtained a piece of property down off of Roaring Rock Road early on in 1941. They, it was just an outbuilding from a house from a Mrs. J. J. G. Stone in New York Harbor. The house is still there. It's down at the corner of Roaring Rock Point and Norwood Farms Road and, and uh, Roaring Rock Road, right near Cow Beach. The volunteers that helped with this aircraft warning, uh, this was their headquarters. And uh, in the winter of 41, 42, the very first winter, they, were, they ran this building 24 hours a day and they ran the observation 24 hours. I mean, it, was, it was a busy little spot, but it was a very, very cold winter. Uh, in the spring of 42, all the volunteers got together and they built a better facility. And this was the facility, it was a tower, uh, three, three level tower where they had an um, area at the top that they could look out upon. It had a wood stove in it. We think that there is, um, was probably a conduit of some kind that took the heat from maybe down below and pushed it up through the building so that the people that were volunteering their time to watch the skies could at least be warmer in the winter. So this building was built in the summer, the spring, late spring of 1942. Just a note on air observation. This was a volunteer piece of the service of civil defense that uh, most towns participated in. I was looking at New Hampshire and there were 195 observation posts that were established in towns in New Hampshire. Not all of them were fancy towers like this, but along the coast, some towns had more than one observation post, but there were 195 of the uh, air observation posts in, in New Hampshire. New York only needed one because of the location of where it was. It was a very commanding view of the sea and the sky and you could see you can see the double light and long sands and boone island and the isles of shoals from this particular location in maine i was looking at some of the statistics there were thirty thousand volunteers in different towns in maine that volunteered their time to do air craft warning services in the in maine thirty thousand a little bit later on in the as the war continued, they were asked to not only look to the skies, but also to be able to look out into the ocean and see if there were any ships out there, surface ships, not submarines, but surface ships of, of potentially the German Navy. The, uh, there was training held for the volunteers. They had flashcards at first, where they had silhouettes of, a, of an American plane versus a, a um, Kevin, I see you, but I don't see myself talking here. Um, I don't know if, I don't know when that got switched. Um, I see you, I'm watching the Facebook feed and I see you uh, being the presenter. Okay. I just switched to me, but once you start talking, I believe we're all set. I think, I think. Okay, I have been talking and I haven't seen my little image show up there. So I didn't know if people are hearing me or not. Hopefully they are. Yeah, we have a good audience. I think one of the most, the, one of the best yet. So things. Oh, good, good. Um, cool. There was training for the volunteers that volunteered at at, at this uh, command post, this tower. Uh, they they did send one fellow, Philip Marston, who was a York resident, sent him to Boston to get some official training from from uh, the the army to to the difference on shapes and sizes and, and silhouettes of planes from Japan, German versus the United States. So that, and he came back and trained a number of the volunteers that were, that manned this particular uh, facility. I was reading one um, account in the, 
old York Historical Society of one of the volunteers. His name was Reverend Millinger. He was, for 27 years, he was the minister of the First Parish Church in York. The, uh, he fought in World War I, and he really wanted to be in World War II. He went to Boston, had a physical, and they flunked him. But that didn't stop him. Uh, he became a member of the draft board, the local draft board. He was on, he was a member of the York's Home Guard. But I was really impressed with his service in this uh, air observation area, aircraft observation. He served 1,500 hours of volunteer time uh, watching the skies and watching the ocean. Just amazing. Um, the dedication that some of these people had. By the way, this uh, post, I I live right in this area and I've been trying to, I, I knocked on a few doors too to try to find out if anyone knew about it. No one knows about it. Uh, and, uh, but I have an idea of where it is. It's long gone. It looks like there's a house there right now. One of the big fancy houses that looks out upon the ocean. Nice spot, but this, this particular facility was taken down. Just a note, this 24 hour a day air observation lasted for about two years from December of 1941 until, uh, until no, December, until December of 1943. By that point in time, it looked like the the threat of an attack from Germany upon the United States, upon the East Coast, uh, was subsiding. All right, there's a couple slides coming up.